and hospitable to what we are, that's what you'd see. And the question is, are we unique? Are there lots of Earths? And that's part of why, why we actually have NASA, to explore that question. So here's Earth, the great water planet. Everywhere you look here, from the oceans to the clouds, to the reasons these rocks are here and not underwater, is controlled by the role of water. Of course, we're largely made of water and other interesting hydrocarbons. So we watch the Earth now, the way we take the pulse of, of our cell form patients. That's pretty cool. Next slide, if you will. So what do we do with the Earth? Well, we look at it in ways that our eyes don't see. This is a time loop of seven years of the biological productivity of our planet. We are a living planet. Okay? How do we know? Because all these colors are representing how we measure biological productivity in the oceans and on land. And so the colors that are hot, red, yellows, stuff is blooming. Phytoplankton growing in the oceans, the fish are having a feeding frenzy. The krill, the whales, the cetaceans, all these things are great. And other things we see here are these dead zones. Both on land, where we've we're experiencing deforestation, the onset of, of arid land regions like deserts, but also in the oceans. And the great explorers of 500 years ago experienced this without knowing. They sailed from Europe up here, down through these dead zones, and actually realized that, holy gosh, there's no fish to catch. Now, you all know the story of Magellan, the first um, team to orbit Earth, right? No? Yes? So, Okay, anyway, he sailed all the way around here in 1520 and then came up across the Pacific Ocean. And for 90 days, he was out of sight of land. And he sailed right through this region where a lot of interesting stuff happens that we now recognize relates to climate here in North America. He sailed through the big dead zone of this southeastern Pacific region and went all the way from here, all the way up to Guam. Ma managed to miss Hawaii, you know, great place, really don't know why but the trade winds and whatever. In any event, he realized firsthand what it's like to see the ocean and how it works. So we know these areas here from our sea lifts project and our continuing monitoring of the Earth um, are deficient. The other thing, if you could um, just go to the next one, Omar. So one of the things that's exciting is we can do better. The other thing we can do is measure the Earth and watch what happens when the consequences of human activity are felt. So this is a map of dust in the atmosphere, where it goes is a function of where it starts, through a loop. And we measure that from our satellites through various mechanisms. I won't go into them all unless you have questions. But so we can track industrial pollution and forest fires from Asia, how they interact with us in North America or with Central America. And this pattern allows us to build not only what we see, but predict what will happen. So just yesterday, you may have seen another volcanic eruption in Meraki in Indonesia with uh, consequential um, tsunamis, that's over here. These kind of volcanoes in the Pacific Ring of Fire erupt explosively. They put dust and ash into the atmosphere. Much bigger than I think you know, in Iceland um, right now. And so those things have global consequences. They affect climate and life. So we now see the consequences of that. Here's forest fires burning in Central Australia. Really exciting time to be able to do this 24-7. So NASA makes a lot of measurements that we use for weather forecasting, predicting hazards. So next slide, let me talk about one that's probably most immediate. One thing we've recognized over the last 25 years is how the ice surface of the Earth goes, and this is the sea ice around Antarctica, and the ice cover of this big freshwater reservoir. How that goes, so goes the climate of Earth. Why is that? It's kind of like the canary in the coal mine effect. The ice cover of the Earth reflects sunlight, keeps the Earth's temperature balanced, if we lose too much of that, the planet can warm up. And we go through cycles of climate. Colder, lots of ice. So here's the Arctic. 500 years ago, many great explorers tried to get through the Northwest Passage, and it didn't exist. And they died trying. I don't know if it's a but it's Halloween. Um, and now we have, and this is up to just recently, we have the Northwest <laughs> Passage. And in fact, that has only happened in the last 10, 15 years. So if the, if the record of ice, sea ice, and ground ice loss continues the way we've measured it for the last 20, what will happen? Well, it will warm up. That's something. Some people like that. But there are global consequences. And sea level will be affected. Sea level. We measure all this stuff with satellite remote sensing, with microwaves, with lasers, with infrared reflectance, 
uh, putting all these things together, the dreams of the 70s are the reality of the 21st century. Next slide. We'll just show you a consequence. So, if we continue to lose sea ice the way we watched it for the last 15 to 20 years, all the areas in red here will become underwater. That's a three foot sea level rise above the mean if we measure every day. Now, you might say, I don't care, three feet, nothing, you know, tell them three feet. Well, the cousin, you know, most of us are, uh, as you with my small dog, might feel otherwise. But in any event, we can all come. So areas that we care about along the, along the Atlantic and the Gulf and the Pacific, in the Caribbean, all around South America, could be ended. The other thing is a small storm coming up into the Mississippi Delta. Instead of just hitting the outer um, dike systems that we put in place, all of a sudden those will be swarming. And so a storm surge of three to five feet of water will go to a new place. Think of the real estate implications and insurance if sea level rise happens. There's small islands in the Pacific. Um, here's Hawaii. There's one you see right here. The island of the nation of Nauru, one of the richest places on Earth. That whole island could be underwater with a three to five foot sea level rise. And these islands sink too. So little, little climate change can produce big effects on people. And even in the coastal deltaic plains of, of Asia, especially in Southeast Asia and the Irrawaddy and Burma, these places, I mean, there's the relief is like this carpet for 50 miles. So hmm, this is what the Earth could do, really, for just natural ebb and flow of climate. And then there's the fact of what we're might be doing, and we're still trying to figure that out. Next slide. So the Earth is a really dynamic world. It's our window onto the universe. Um, and this is an interesting one. Remember what? I guess the loop didn't go. <coughs> just go to the next one. There we go. Now, this is something that looks like my middle school kids, uh, you know, coloring project. Let's color the earth in film. What it really is, is the earth in 3D underground. How did we do that without drilling lots of holes, you might ask? Drilling, not good um, for this purpose. What we do is we measure the small wiggles between two satellites, about the size of little refrigerators, streaming along. We measure the wiggles between those variations to a millionth of a meter per second. And those small motions, little accelerations, these little dancing satellites, can tell us what's underground. So here are the great underground aquifers of water, shown in blue, under South America and the Amazon basin, up in the mid-continent region, the mid-continent basin of the United States. This groundwater map, as well as others we can do, shows us, A, we have to worry about groundwater. We use it extensively in the United States and in other worlds. Australia is, is famous for that. It also allows us to talk, start to see how we can measure our Earth better. I predict in the next 10 or 20 years, we'll be able to take this technology and do it 10 to 100 times better. We won't only watch the, the regional scale of underground water. We'll watch air mass densities move. And their humidity, the amount of water vapor in them, will change the mass, which will change the gravity, and we'll be able to measure that. That will allow us to better predict weather and trends in weather and subtle variations on the planet. This is the stuff of this this senses things down multiple, multiple miles. And what we're doing is we're actually measuring changes in mass, which affect small changes in gravity, micro changes, you know, changes that you know are are based on large movements of water or in the ocean of heat. This mission called GRACE was originally selected, I was the project scientist work when I first started so long ago, to measure how the heat flow in the ocean moves the water around. The water actually puffs up when it gets hot and sinks when it gets cold. Produces currents, really cool stuff about climate and how the earth works. We realize now, after 10 years, we can actually use it to look inside the earth. Same technique will be used to map the crust of the moon in 2011 with a mission being developed at uh, MIT and the Propulsion Lab. And so we want to apply this to other worlds too. But it's a revolution. Again, before the mid 90s, when this was first thought out, this was the stuff of dreams. So this is just our Earth. Next slide over. 